Hello and welcome to the channel. My name is Matt and welcome to yet another week of Downshift Racing the Recap. This week, which I believe is week four, is starting out on the Daytona International Speedway with Magnum Star's All-American Classics race. And this one starting out was actually, this week was quite an exciting week for me for more personal reasons, but for the fact of the matter is I had finally made the decision to get a clutch pedal, get a shifter, and get a handbrake. So the shifter had just come in, I had just put it all together and got it up and running, and it had taken me so much time to get it up and ready to go that I joined the lobby with 10 minutes to go until race. So I'm trying out a H pattern shifter for the first time. I don't think the clutch pedal came in yet. And I am miss shifting horribly. And I'm just like, you know what? I need to just stop worrying about this for like two seconds, get a decent lap time in and, and call it a day. So those next 10 minutes was the only practice that I had gotten for this race and this race was one that everybody was looking forward to for quite some time actually so people were getting their tunes ready they're getting their cars ready they're getting some very quick uh, lap times so the fastest lap time for the entire race was like a 144.3 and the best lap time i was able to pull out was a 150.7 so not even in the same freaking category it was just it was not good and i'm finding out in retrospect the main thing that everybody got part of their tunes was that when it comes to daytona there's a massive stretch where your car is just going out to the top speed i did not adjust my transmission whatever so it was just in whatever setting it was i just wasn't getting the speed and honestly i was just kind of vibing it was just one of those races where it's like you know I didn't have any time practicing, so I'm not going to get uptight in the fact that I'm not competitive. I'm just going to sit back and enjoy it as much as I can, you know? And there are some moments, actually, that, you know, I got close to the pack. And mainly it was because other people were screwing up, which was rather uncharacteristic for a lot of these people. Uh, Shio had this big uh, screw-up where he was behind me for about half the race, and then finally his top speed just took off you know just way past me but the other one was actually unfortunately magnum had just a lot of really weird mistakes where he would just you know spit out and so then you know there are a lot of portions in the race where we're going pretty close but again he had tuned up his uh, transmission just like everybody else so he had the uh, better top speed so i'm i know that any racing was inevitably in vain just from the standpoint that whenever it come to the top speed portions of the course which is about two-thirds of the course <laughs> it was just i couldn't keep up i just couldn't so there are times where you know he'd fall off get a penalty and we'd be racing to the penalty line he'd still be in front and then we get into the first sector and i'd be on his tail but then by the sector two and sector three he was just he was gone so looking at my lap times because I'm still trying to figure this car out and uh, you know what the setup was previously and trying to make sure that it works with this course. I mean the lap times are kind of all over the place. I, I got into a pretty good groove and because I was driving so slow, even though the lap times don't really reflect it, I actually kept my own mistakes to a quite minimal amount. There was one point on lap one where I grab uh, inside curb of the bus stop and have a little bit of a moment then there's another part where I had where I just braked late on coming in to the first corner and got a half second penalty or whatever from it and then there's another spot where I just cut the bus stop again on the way out and from what I recall that was pretty much about it so again it's kind of interesting to see when you're not pushing the car, just how much of a groove you can get in. And again, it was quite unfortunate that I didn't have the practice or the setup or anything. But because of last week, 
I was okay just hanging out because I was having a great time. It was great conversations and just great hanging with the group. So it was at this point where I'm like, you know, I'm hoping that I can take some time to really focus on this Thursday a little bit. Try to get some tunes a little bit better, get a little bit better practice. But before we do that, I want to take a quick moment for a message from our sponsor today. Are you suffering from slow and inconsistent lap times? Are your tunes just not good enough? Do you have a secret rampant foot fetish that will destroy your life if we're ever uncovered? Well, I have a deal for you. Join me at Pavin's Feet Picks and Driving Tips. We have big feet, small feet, hairy feet, dirty feet, and all the different types of feet you can think of. In the caption of every feet pick, we include the most up-to-date information on how to improve your lap times from racing line explanations, brake by setups, heel and toe demonstrations, and brand new tunes every week. Did your wife catch you looking at the feet picks? Well, tell her you're here for the driving tips. Do your racing driver friends also have a debilitating foot fetish that will ruin their racing career if anyone found out? Well, show them the feet picks. Join today for a monthly subscription of $6.99 or an annual renewal for $69. Join me today at OnlyFans.com slash feet picks driving tips. Again, that's OnlyFans.com slash feet pick driving tips for only the best feet picks and driving tips in the business. Thank you to Pavin's feet picks and driving tips for the sponsorship. I really appreciate that here. So for Thursday, we are on Watkins Glen with our Group B rally cars once again. And... Again, rather than practicing, on Wednesday, my handbrake and my clutch pedal came in. So I spent all Wednesday, you know, putting it together. And then when it comes to race day, I think I was trying to make the H pattern work with the clutch and I wasn't able to get it to run right. So I think I settled on sequential for the race. But regardless, not a lot of time went into practicing. So we do qualifying. I qualify fourth, actually, weirdly enough. And reverse grid goes into order. So I actually start in sixth place. So in front of me, I've got Junior, I've got Omar, Bulldog, Magnum, and Ring. And first lap was really interesting because off the line, I take Ring pretty quickly. And shortly thereafter, you know, Magnum has a couple of issues. But you know, by the end of lap one, I'm starting to really have these close fights with Bulldog and Omar and Junior trying to keep up with the pack. And it was honestly really cool. It was some really great fighting. You know, Omar got on the inside of me close to the end of the lap. But then as we're getting around the lap, apparently our lap one jitteriness was not quite yet over because this incredible moment happens. Oh, come on. That's a penalty. Three wide, I'm down the middle. Woo. All right. Damn, sir. you yep. just put somebody in the yep. I deserve that oh, one. Oh, you just murdered Paige. Yeah. 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 Um. <laughs> My God. Uh-oh. Coming down to turn one, Bulldog runs wide and I come up very quickly to both Junior and Omar. I put my car in the wrong spot. I don't allow any room for Junior to turn. He, cra he crashes into me, slams into the wall. I go wide, snag a tiny bit of grass, smack into Paven, spin out. Everybody's coming through this massive incident and I collect rain in the middle of all of it. And what's surprising to me the most is how dramatic this crash is, but how fairly few people it actually affected. So, of course, my sincerest apologies to both Paven and Ring. Not great to ever have a crash, but man, was it an exciting crash, will I say. Coming out of it, uh, Shio makes, the, makes up the place, and interestingly enough, I didn't, because I was busy having my moment, I didn't hear about this until much later. Apparently, right after that, in the bus stop, there's another incident where another three people got collected and it was another major moment. And coming out of the bus stop, I'm able to pass up Flanders. So now, at this point, I'm just trying to settle into the groove, just trying to let whatever happened pass and just focus on my race. At this point, I'm like, I had this max massive accident in the beginning. I just need to work through it. I need to just get in my groove and just work through this. I'm not going to finish well because of it. What was interesting is as the laps ticked away, I was actually making up ground. I was not expecting my car to be 
as quick as it was. I was just putting in the laps, putting down the times, and versus being out in the middle of nowhere, no man's land, I had people in front of me that were just coming towards me. By lap five, I was able to catch back up to Magnum and make that pass. And then shortly thereafter, I actually have some close fighting with Junior. So then by turn one, Junior goes wide, and I also have a little bit of understeer. And I completely forget to allow him to rejoin the track there. So again, another minute problem there, but we we're able to figure it out. I was able to just kind of pull off into the distance and not really have too many more issues with uh, racing in incidents of that kind of nature. So as the race went on, I was able to finally start putting up some very good laps. I got a 155.7 on lap six and the fastest lap of the race i believe was flanders at a 153.5 so only less than two seconds off the pace i'm feeling pretty decent and as the laps are going down i'm actually slowly 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 making some progress up to get up to omar and it was about lap nine where I'm getting really close here. So the final chicane of sector two, he has a little bit of an incident when his car has a huge snap of oversteer, goes on into the inside, grabs a track limit penalty, and we are now fighting hard. Which I go to the right, he goes to the right. I start going to the left, he starts going to the left a little bit. But then on the next corner there, he breaks early, I go around the outside, and make the move stick. That fight, in my mind, was maybe going to be a little bit in vain eventually because of that one second track limit penalty that he had to serve. Not this lap, but the next lap it turned out. And sure enough, by that point, I managed to put a pretty decent gap between us. He served it, and I was pretty much solidly in fourth until the end. And by the last lap, that's pretty much what happened. It's, I'm sitting in a little bit of no man's land here, it's with my massive accident that I had. I was too far away from the top three to really get anywhere close to a podium. I was hoping that maybe an accident of their own would have happened, but man, that they're just on another level. And thankfully, I didn't have any more incidents or any more issues, so I managed to solidly stay in fourth place. And aside from that first and second lap issues that I had, I was pretty happy with my race. It was... I felt competitive, I made up a lot of great places, had a lot of great fights, there were a lot of moments that I was able to, you know, put my car in a place where it needed to be to avoid an incident, and yes, there were some moments that I could have been a little bit of better of a driver, but again, as every one of these sessions go, every day is a learning experience, so not too shabby of a race then, I, I suppose. And for the last race of our session, it is our Sunday race where we're on Fuji International Speedway. We are with 700 PowerPoint limit vehicles. It is mid-engined, rear-wheel drive, and these were crazy fast. So we had all sorts of just crazy cars that we were just bringing to this lobby, and a lot of everybody in the group was talking about all sorts of different strategies. The strategies were all over the place, which was really exciting to see because it wasn't ever completely clear who was going to be in front and who wasn't. So as a lot of these strategy races go, I just throw on some hard tires. I put it to field mode six. Turns out that by detuning the 787B to the manner that I did, I was just able to really just actually keep it on fuel mode one and manage to keep out the uh, keep out the fuel economy, which is pretty nice. But uh, lap one jitters for me was kind of a struggle bust this race. I had dirt on my tires. I, it's just the grip off of the first lap just was not great. My tires were not warmed up, so I was doing some really weird moves that. In all honesty, I probably shouldn't have done anyway, but especially with the fact that my grip wasn't there, so I pulled a couple of weird moves on Shane, which I do apologize about that. And then by the end of lap one and into lap two, I have yet another incident at the beginning of lap two. Oh, to the left. hello, Drew. Yeah, he made a left I, turn quick. I can break way later than you guys, sorry. That's gonna be weird in that turn. No traction control, so struggle bus. Oh my god. Cut. Come on. There we go. 
So my decision to turn off traction control was kind of an interesting one because for the most part, for everything, pretty much everything, I just run traction control too. And it's like, it's perfect for me because it just, I'm still getting used to turning off all the assists. Pretty much everything else is off apart from ABS, which is on weak. But I just can't, can't take traction control off yet completely. I just seen a couple of videos from Super GT or a couple of other YouTubers that they're running without traction control. And I'm sitting here with a massively detuned 787B going, you know, I could probably turn off traction control and actually start setting some pretty decent laps. It's because I've got it so heavily detuned, the wheel spin is not going to be as bad as it normally is. And I was right. I was it didn't understeer as bad as it normally did. I was able to get the power down a little bit better. You know, it wasn't having issues locking up or not having enough grip. But when I inevitably would hit a curb or run wide and then try to throw the power down, there was just enough wheel spin and just enough lack of grip where, you know, spinning out is a completely, totally potential option to happen. And that's what happened. So I had a feeling that I wasn't going to be all that competitive this race as it was, but as soon as I had that lap two incident, it's just like I, I felt like the race was done. But as a lot of the people in this group go, uh, one of the mottos that have shown up is it's not over until it's over. And that was very much so the, the truth of it, because I knew that people would be, you know, using up their soft tires and then they'd have to pit for fuel at some point and then have to throw on hard tires. And when people are running these soft tire builds where they're getting their car up to 700 power points on softs, when they move down to hards, they're at like 620 power points and they have no grip and the car just feels weird. So I'm just really hoping that when these people move over to hards is that they have massive issues. And to be fair, there weren't that many massive issues apart from when... Um, Shio has an incident where everybody's moving to the right, he's moving to the right, and then realizes that some people are pitting, some people aren't, tries to get out, and takes out rain in the process. And as I'm coming up on this main street, I've got this big cloud of smoke in front of me, and I'm just worried that I'm going to get collected and lose some more time. Thankfully, I was able to get out of the way of everything. But that was another race completely demolished for a ring so i'll be honest i'm not sure what happened with this sunday in particular but all day i've just felt really lethargic and really tired and was constantly taking quick little short cat naps and just never quite waking up so this race on its own on top of the fact that my carpal tunnel was just feeling really bad i had issues all weekend with with my hands not gripping well my thumb hurting and my shoulder hurting it just i felt like an old man this weekend so when it came to this race, I'm just hoping that none of this is setting in. I'm hoping that my my focus can still be there, that I'm alert and I'm aware of everything that's happening. I'm, I'm hoping that the carpal tunnel and the arthritis really doesn't set in. And for the most part, I was actually quite happy to see this. My lap times were rock steady solid. I was looking at it in hindsight i was quite impressed about how consistent those lap times were i was able to dip into the 141s just a little bit but the majority of them are 142s and every now and again i go a little bit wide and get a 143 for a lap time so i was pretty okay with that so at this point as the race is starting to come to a close i've got two maybe three races going on in my mind so my main focus for all of this is just a consistent lap time trying not to push it too hard that I'm going too wide and then losing some lap time and then potentially losing a place in front of me Berserker is having a couple of issues of his own but his car is super quick on, quick on the straights so I know I'm not really going to catch him but I'm just hoping that if he has enough issues going wide or not having enough traction that I might be able to snag another place up into sixth place. But for the most part, I'm not really focused on that. I'm more focused behind me. So with all the incidences and all the issues that Ring had this race, he finally manages to go into the pits, throws on some medium tires, gets some fuel, and 
those laps that he did right after that were kind of starting to scare me because he threw in a fastest lap time of 137.4 and I'm sitting here in the 142 ranges. After his pit, he was about 32 seconds down and had about half the race left and I'm sitting there going, okay, as my laps are going on, I'm trying to do some mental math here going, all right, so if he's five seconds a lap faster than me, then I'm going to lose seventh in about lap 16. And I'm just kind of dreading this. But as it turns out, he had just one quick lap time. But all of the other laps are about three seconds faster than mine. And thank God that was the case. Because in my mind, I was like, as laps were taken away, it's like, okay, so I've got four lap laps left. Three seconds a lap times four. So he's about 12 seconds behind. He's actually 14. Okay, so I'm good. And then, again, the laps kept going down, so it's three laps left. Okay, is he nine seconds down? Two laps left, is he six? One lap down, he's at three. Okay, great. So once again, I have the issue that I forget to take NOS. It's, I've used the 787B for pretty much everything, and it just, I had the tune right. I just, when I was practicing, NOS was never a thing in you know the qualifying laps or anything like that. It was only used for the race. And then it just wasn't there for a race. So it's, yes, I probably could have made up maybe a place. But if we're going off of maybes, I could have also done a lot better had I not had the lap two instant. I digress. But when it came down to it, I had the feeling that Ring was a lot faster than me on the streets because he would have Nas and I wouldn't. But when I'm getting to the end of sector two, he's still three seconds behind me and I'm going, all right, cool, we're done. Uh, it's three seconds behind, we're good. And then in that last sector alone, he makes up all of that time where I'm looking behind me and on the map, there are some just what appears to be some egregious corner cutting, but apparently he figured out the line and where the track limits were and I just hadn't. And my car in that last sector is quite clunky and I'm aware of it and isn't too bad in the straight. So I'm just like, oh, and suddenly I'm worrying that I'm focusing too much in the mirror and that I'm going to have my own mess up. So I start focusing on my race and just turned off looking at the mirror and just focused on that last part. And thankfully, he did not have a whole lot of NOS left in that tank because by the time we don't went over the line, it was about eight tenths behind. So if it was, so if there was one more lap, I would have guaranteed you that he would have been about two to three seconds ahead of me by the time we crossed the line. So in all honesty, yeah, it's a little bit sad that I was about 45 seconds off first place's pace. But with everything said and done, the fact that I was only 45 seconds off, I if I didn't have a lap two incident and didn't have those issues in lap one, I probably could have been within 25 seconds. I probably could have had fourth, fifth place, maybe, if we're really stretching it. But at the end of the day, we can sit back and go, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if, what if. But in all honesty, you know, for kind of a crappy start, I think it did pretty decently. Those lap times were just rock solid. So I'm pretty impressed with how that went all said and done. So if you're still watching, thanks so much for watching. Hope you uh, enjoyed this video. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe as always. Next week, we'll have another very cool uh, recap for week five for the Downshift Racing League. The Tuesday race, that first race, in my mind, is going to be very exciting because it's the Peugeot 908 HDI FAP, the 2010. So we are the Group 1 car on Alsace, and it's it's going to be a doozy. So make sure you stay subscribed for that. It's going to be a very exciting race. Again, thanks so much for watching. Hope you guys have a great day today. Take care. Bye.